Well, thank you, Alexis, and I'm very glad to be back and participate in the Delphi Economic Forum. Now, there is no uh, doubt that uh, the EU is currently facing an extraordinary combination of risks that, in my view, pose a very serious threat to its existence. And I think this worrisome state of affairs is a consequence of a number of events that have unfolded sequentially and successively, and sometimes simultaneously, over the past few years. And at present, the EU is facing a number of risks. I, I identified seven, but there are more. First of all, the decision of Britain to leave the Union, the migration and refugee crisis, the rise of populism and nationalism uh, in a number of member states, the continuing debt and economic crisis in Greece, as well as the implications of the Eurozone crisis on other countries that were vulnerable and stressed, the ongoing crisis in Ukraine, the low level of trust and confidence in the EU and the European institutions, and last but not least, what we can call the DTA factor, that is the Donald Trump's administration uncertain and possibly negative attitude towards the EU and the Euro. Now, these seven risks are not only evolving in parallel, but they are also interrelated and interacting. And I think this is what makes the cumulative effect potentially dangerous. And they reflect underlying more fundamental concerns relating, first of all, to the weak economic recovery and the very high unemployment, the rising inequality of incomes, which is combined with a perception that this is partly due to globalization, as well as to the ineffective policies, rules, and regulations imposed by European institutions. And finally, also the continuing divergence of uh, the economic situation in member states. These broad underlying factors are those that explain some of the risks that are present. Now, in assessing the, the future of the euro, I think it is important to try to address the following three questions. First of all, why is it important to save the European project and strengthen European integration? If it's not important, we shouldn't bother. Second, on the assumption that the answer is positive, and I'll say two words on it, what policy actions and institutional reforms are necessary in order to foster European integration and in order to secure the stability and viability of the euro? And the final one, of course, is what are the prospects, especially in view of electoral, of the upcoming elections, as well as developing global forces. Now, with regard to the, I think that the reasons of why European integration should be preserved and strengthened are both economic and political. There are, first of all, important political and geopolitical considerations that suggest that strengthening the European Union is important, and this is relevant both for addressing the short-term as well as the long-term challenges that the European Union is facing. I think it's evident to most, although not all, that a number of the problems that the European Union is facing at present, such as the Ukraine crisis, the threats stemming from the Middle East and elsewhere, cannot really be resolved effectively by the actions of individual member states, including the very large ones. So they require a common approach and coordinated action. Now, looking more over the long term, I think important demographic trends globally and the changing political and economic la landscape which is being shaped by ra the rapidly growing emerging market economies, suggest that over the long run, if the European Union wants to be an important and influential player which will defend and promote its own interest, it has to be united. But this, of course, requires a long-term vision. And finally, and I think this is important for my last uh, part, turning to the key economic issues, the economic reasons for preserving and strengthening the European Union, I think we have to focus on the Eurozone because the member states which share a single currency are already integrated in many and powerful ways and they are subject to very specific rules 
that require uh, a further completion and enhancement of the monetary union. Now, is such an economic integration in the Eurozone, is, is rather the current economic integration in the Eurozone stable and viable? I mean, we have no time for a detailed analysis of this, but I can give you the short and, in my view, correct answer. In the long run, the Eurozone will be inherently stable and viable if and only if it is further strengthened and completed. Unless this is done, it is likely that the EMU will eventually break when new shocks occur and if and when the economic, its economic performance does not improve. So far as you know, the Eurozone has succeeded in weathering uh, the crisis with one exception which is known to all in this room. But what has been accomplished is clearly insufficient, in particular augmenting and strengthening the financial and economic pillars of the EMU is not sufficient to secure the future stability and viability. So what should be done to protect financial and macroeconomic stability in the Eurozone? As you know, there are many suggestions. There is the so-called Five Presidents Report published two years ago. There are many proposals by academics and institutions. And only yesterday, Jean-Claude Juncker presented a white paper which includes a number of reflections on the way forward and a number of alternative scenarios. Now, in my view, and over the relevant medium term, that is over the next two or three years, it is necessary to take the following four steps in order to ensure stability and viability of the euro. The first is the completion of the banking union, and we can elaborate later on what we mean by that. The second is the faster integration of capital markets so firms can have access to other sources of finance than bank credit, and also in order to create a system that absorbs more securely asymmetric systemic shocks. Third, more important and more controversial, we need a higher degree of fiscal integration in the European Union, which is, first of all, needed in order to achieve the previous two objectives, and uh, it's also necessary for more general reasons. And fourth, related to the above, we need the introduction of institutional changes and procedures in order to strengthen the political foundations of the European Monetary Union. That is, in order to provide democratic accountability and legitimacy to the, pro to the, to the process. I think the key prerequisite uh, for successfully taking these steps is greater public understanding and political support for the proposition that the efficient and robust functioning of the monetary union requires the establishment of some form of fiscal union. I'm not talking about a full fiscal union, I'm not referring to any political integration, but we need a certain form that we could perhaps discuss later on. Now, I'm coming to the end. With regard to the areas where I feel fiscal union is warranted, a greater degree of fiscal integration, let me put it this way, is warranted and is politically more acceptable, is public inter, uh, in infrastructure, in physical and human capital, unemployment insurance, immigration, and defense. And we may elaborate on this more specifically later on. So now, what, what are the prospects and what are the immediate actions? Now, if you on the forthcoming elections in uh, the Netherlands, France, and Germany, I would say that over the short run, that is over the next few months, it seems to me we have to adopt a pragmatic and prudent approach, which is to wait and see for the outcome of the elections, and in the meantime, to try to enhance the communication that underscores the importance of the way forward and underlines also the risks if this is not done. But over the medium and longer term, which I defined as a horizon of the next two to three years, I think it is important that the Termin and Bolter action will be needed along the line suggested and possibly others in order to secure the future both of the EU and the Euro. Now, as in the past, it can be expected that this will be done by following a step-by-step -step approach, and I think for some of the measures, it is likely, as also Mr. Juncker suggested yesterday, that this is done 
at variable speeds. But what is important in my mind, and I'm coming to the end with this, is that whatever steps are taken are meaningful and concrete. And they address current challenges that cannot be easily resolved by the actions of individual member states. And second, that they make a real difference in terms of strengthening economic growth, reducing inequality, and mitigating the disparities across member states. And these are really the means, that is, actions that achieve three, these objectives that can address Euroscepticism and secure the future of the Euro. If you would ask me, this is what you asked me at the beginning, what is my view about the prospects of the Euro? I would say that, in my view, the prospects are positive despite the risks and the tensions for one fundamental reason. And the reason is that if a major crisis or difficult events uh, occur in the future, I believe that the leaders will focus on fundamentals and will take the necessary actions to avoid a catastrophe. And we have seen this happening both at the European level in 2012, 13, and later on, and also at the national level. However, Alexis, being in Delphi and thinking that some may think that this conclusion is rather optimistic, before coming here, I tried to ask uh, the advice of the Oracle. Now, I couldn't find her, and, but I think she saw me. And uh, I think she read my mind because I received a tweet from her before entering the room. <laughs> and the tweet said, be prudent and pragmatic, but also bold and fast. If you want to make Euro, Europe great again, and make her number one.